All right, great. Thanks, thanks again for giving the floor to me. I'm happy to present work now, work that was done by a team. Next to me it was Rosa, is Rosa Aguilar, who is also with us today, and Karen Pfeffer. Um, and I'm presenting work that we call OGITO, an open geospatial interactive tool to support collaborative urban planning. And before I say anything else, I have to say, and I'm happy and I'm proud to say, most of the work done by Rosa because it was her PhD and the credits all have to go to her. She had defended the PhD four weeks ago, six weeks ago, and I'm just presenting, and, but any technical questions in particular go to her for sure. So um, to explain a bit like why we developed what we developed, what's the background of that, I have to go back once again to this notion of urban planning we discussed this morning already. There are tons of definitions of what urban planning means and a very short one which I am very much inclined to and which makes clear why we do the things that we do is uh, imagine urban planning as being a, a process of intersubjective communication between different stakeholders, as I mentioned this morning already, in different arenas and settings to actively create or co-create knowledge among the different stakeholders. And that's so far, I don't want to go more into the planning domain, um, but to facilitate this kind of co-creation and collaboration among of different stakeholders, um, there are numbers, tons of different tools being developed, digital tools over the last 20, 30 years. Specialized GIS tools, you often find them as decision support tools, planning support tools. Um, and since a couple of years, uh, around about 10 years, I would say, there is uh, more uh, attention to tools that are being implemented on those tables, on those map table tools that I'm showing here also in the two figures. So um, these map table tools are well, a certain type of planning support tool which are particularly mentioned or aimed to facilitate stakeholder interaction on, as you see here on the right figure, uh, and to create knowledge together with different stakeholders, make decisions, let them design on the interactive surface, which is a GIS platform or a G uh, specialized GIS tool, also a planning support system, if you want to say so. Um, and thereby to create knowledge and make decisions jointly, which is kind of the, the core of, the, of planning. And the simple but very important gap that we encounter since 10 years, since we run a lab here in, in the house where we work with such tools, is there's no, literally no intuitive, easy to use, uh, user-friendly software for implementing on such map tables. There's lots of GIS software, of course, you, most of you know many of these, but they are not made for tangible user interfaces, for touch screens, uh, and there is particularly no open source development. There was one particular uh, tool, software development, a couple of years ago by a Dutch company, which many of us know also from Amsterdam, made for map tables, but that was licensed, was pretty expensive, was a basic tool functionality only and is also not contained anymore. So obviously there is no market for that. So that's why the research gap that we address with this development and, and the PhD of Rosa was pretty much developing an open source, user-friendly, intuitive to use, map table based planning support system. And well, we did that and we just succeeded, as I said, uh, and we developed Ogito an open geospatial interactive tool. While the name Ogito results from a field work that we did in Indonesia, our first case study where we developed it. Um, but I'm not going to details now because I was told I should keep it short. So Ogito is a full-fledged map table based planning support system with well different elements. I numbered them here, uh, a map interface that you can use with gestures so it's fully operable, op operated by, by touch gestures, zoom in, zoom out, all gestures are implemented on the, on the, on the surface, on, on the screen. A layer panel, an editing toolbar, some general functions of queries and stuff like that, uh, and a symbol panel. So different features that are all designed depending on different um, case studies. Important to mention here that Orgito is a basic framework developed in an open source environment. I will show that in a minute. But we developed it in two case studies and each, each case study has different features and functionality. So that's why each Ogito tool 
comes a bit different. I will explain a few details about the two case studies that we developed on so far, uh, because they were both developed in a sort of uh, user-centered design process or a co-design together with the users. And that is something we put potentially uh, particularly focus on in, in the PhD to go through with our users, with the uh, uh, aimed at users to, for the tool to go through a co-design process to overcome what is widely described in literature as the, lift to, uh, as the implementation gap, the PSS implementation gap. The problem with many of the tools is are developed in science, they're developed in universities, research centers, but when it comes to the application and in planning practice with, with, with cities, there is hardly any tool on, and tools are just not taken up because they are run out of development time. When the project is over, they are not further maintained, they are not updated, and they are not easy to use. And that's why it's our ambition um, to develop the tools with the users, to have specific functionality in it that is, can be used by the users and that is useful for them, that they need to have in it, and, and follow this user design process. Uh, in short, we started from a rough base PSS tool uh, conceptualization or concept of the PSS tool that we developed from expert interviews and then we went in both cases, uh, both case studies through this process of um, co-design starting from user story writing and prioritizing user stories together with the users making lo-fi um, mock-ups of, of how the, the solutions function look at look like and then we made first uh, prototypes of different functionality that we tested then with the users again till we went then to um, having some workshop settings, testing workshop settings first with students in the house and, and staff members in the house before, before we went into the field and, and did the real workshops with the users, uh, with the um, real users in the, in the real context of use or the, the case studies. Uh, and to understand how good the tool works, how to th th understand usability and usefulness of the tools to get feedback on how much do we achieve now the goals that we had with the development. We did an evaluation afterwards by questionnaires and, and did a couple of interviews with the stakeholders to get feedback on different aspects of usability and usefulness. Um, here is roughly sketched out the, the, the architecture of the Ogitol tool as it looks like. It comes as a browser functionality on the front end. The back end is, well, a database in, uh, concluding, including all the geographic data. Uh, and then by a QGIS server application connecting the back end to the front end. And the front end is, based, uh, is developed in an Angular in, uh, environment including the different features that Rosa can explain way much better than I do. That's why I skipped this part now for the time being. Um, we, as I said, we developed it in two different case studies. Uh, the first one that we worked on was a rural land use planning and budgeting process in a rural Indonesia in Semarang, where we worked with stakeholders on developing a village-based land use mapping tool, basically which the, the cities or the villages had to do anyhow by default by, by well, planning law. And we, we engaged with the, the stakeholders, not with them directly, but we had another PhD student who was in touch with them, who knew all the user stories that they would write because it was given by, by the planning law what features need to be included in the tool. That's where our user stories in that case come, study comes from. And then we developed the, the mapping tool went to Indonesia with our map, uh, map tables and did some, in three villages, did some experiments there. The second case study is a case study on noise action planning in, that we tested and developed with experts and stakeholders in, in Bochum, in Germany. Uh, just a very quickly on a bit of background, um, noise action planning is a requirement. A noise action plan is something that every city has to develop by European law, by EU directive. Um, and by this directive also citizens have to be engaged in, in this noise action planning by mapping um, quiet and noisy places, subjectively perceived quiet and noisy places that is taken into account by the planners next to the officially or the, the modeled and, and, and measured noise levels from different sources. 
uh, and they also citizens are also engaged in devising measures or suggesting measures how to mitigate noise levels in certain locations. And the tool as developed covers all those different stages of user engagement in, in the development. Now already coming to the end, a bit of an outlook. So these pro two projects are ready. We had got quite some positive feedback on the, on the tool, of the usability of the tool and the value of it, and that encouraged also us to de further develop it. At the moment, we have two small projects, both lasting only one year, with a bit of funds also to further develop the, pl the platform. And um, we at, have the opportunity to develop, or we, we aim to go with this, the two projects into the developing the platform further into an inclusive mapping tool. And inclusive means for us access to all people in a society having, having access to the tool. And we particularly work with two groups of uh, people with disabilities, in the Netherlands one group of people with um, physical disabilities, a group of people sitting in the wheelchair, some people having uh, visual or auditive impairments, and we work with them, we generate user stories with them, all, both on the, all on the topic of public accessibility or accessibility to public spaces. And the same we do with a group of people with um, cognitive disabilities in the German case studies. Again, user design co studies from them, which is much more difficult, with, with particular with cognitive disabilities, deriving user stories from them, and then trying to develop or aiming, working on, right that, on that right now, developing a more inclusive, a more inclusive, because it will never be a fully inclusive, I must admit, understanding all the user needs, of course, now, but aiming to develop a more inclusive mapping tool that is accessible both hardware and software-wise for people with different usabilities. Um, software development capacity is, is always a shortcoming here in ITC if we don't have uh, software developers in our department, as I said this morning already. That's why it's also interesting to have this collaboration with eScience Center for the future. The way we solve it now, we have started up a, set up a collaboration with 52 NORS. ITC colleagues know 52 NORS, of course. Um, for the others, it's uh, from Münster, a uh, spin-off of the uh, University of Münster in G from Geoinformatics since many years already, and they are specialized in geospatial software development. And they develop the currently the software tools now for us and the further development of Ogito, Ogito Accessible. We don't have a name yet for it. We'll see how we call it. Um, and, and, and we test it with, with our co-researchers. The long-term vision that I have, that we have with the tool, is to make it really available as an open source, open so, uh, pack software package to be used for map tables and give it to third parties that they can implement their own data, their own tools, and make their own application from that. Because I hear, wherever I go with the tools, and wherever we demonstrate it, we, I hear from cities, from planners, from from regions, they say they see the need in that, but there are no tools available. And that's why I personally think we need to go, we want to go in that direction of making the tool in the longer run, even for non-programmers, better accessible so that they can set it up and develop, put their own data in. Thanks. observation um, um, among the software that we see so far it was the only one which was not in English so basically one one was in in, in German I mean in the case study picture that you saw and the other one was also in, in uh, Indonesia in, in Indonesian so uh, that shows the user centric approach from my point of view which was nice very nice to see in fact uh -huh. um, and the second thing you mentioned this uh, noise ma mapping is mandatory according to the to the directive the European directive so that uh -huh. means a uh, hundreds or even thousands of cities in Europe have to do that how are they doing right now so they, they lack this kind of tools I would lie if I say I have an overview of all case studies of course but the reason why we choose the German case study of Bochum as, as our partners because we have some colleagues working at the university there and they are the domain experts in noise action planning actually and they had done a similar process in an analog form for the city where they used just printed maps 
and then they had sticky notes to people indicating. You can also do it on paper base, of course, but then also in comparison, we tested the, the added value of having different layers that you can turn off and turn off, zoom in, different scale levels. So there is quite some advantage if you do it all digitally. But I suppose that many municipalities do it sometimes not even spatially, just by questionnaires or whatever. I mean, it's in the, in the EU directive, it says you have to participate, your citizens, but it, of course, it does not say how you do that. And that's one way. It has also limitations because you can only put six, eight people, depending on the size of the table around it. So you need to have multiple tables or you need to have a representative groups. Yeah? So, but there are different uh, methods of how to do the, the participa participation, of course. Thank you very much. There's a question. Yeah. Um, you, you just mentioned that, that map table basically restricts the ability of, of multiple people to collaborate at the same time. What is the benefit above having, let's say, a shared screen and, and multiple mm -hmm. Thanks. Good point. I forgot to mention that in the beginning. The benefit that I, every time I do it here in our lab with students or with, with petitioners, uh, the moment that you put a group of people, different stakeholders, whoever they are, around the table and give them tasks to interact with the digital content, it triggers a communication. It triggers like uh, asking questions, uh, making statements, rational for choices that they make on the table. That's why we also we often record what is being said while they work on a table. And this is this verbal information, this argument that people make while they say, I think we should put the next windmill, also in renewable energy, we do a lot of stuff in that we should go there or this one, this area should be protected or here it's very noisy. This argument that is uh, foot for salt for planners and that you only achieve when you put them around the table. You can also do it virtually, but it's, and we had to do it during Corona, but that is, it's a different story and you don't have that active interaction, uh, this dynamic interaction. And when you do it one-to-one, -one, yeah, then there's no need for communicating at all. Okay, so it's literally like the, the, the interaction of, of the, the, the physical hands, etc., above the map. It's like the extent that you put on the map. It's like that, that you can have an auditorium where people draw on the map. Yeah. Well, that, so the interaction of the users with the map, but more so, or more important sometimes, even the interaction of the people with each, which is with each other. So if you put two, two different stakeholders with a different point of view on a certain issue of where to put a windmill or whatever, and you, you let them work in a two-hour, three-hour workshop, you, you observe things like, okay, now I understand your point better and you understand me better. So it's something like coming closer, not agreeing, not finding consensus eventually, though that would be ideal, but exchanging standpoints and, and coming or understanding other people's view. That for us is planners an achievement in a story process. And that is what you, you gain when you put people around such a device. Or you, it can also be a map. It doesn't have to be, we also did that in manual form or in, in analog form. When you have multiple people, when you have 50 people, you don't have 50 tables, of course, of course or 20 tables. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you very much again, Johannes. Thanks. So, uh, yeah, I think during a break we can have, continue the discussion.